cloud. Um, okay, so uh, so welcome welcome back to the Electronic Algebraic K Theory Seminar. So today we're very happy to have Michelle Groschenik from uh, from Toronto, who will tell us about the epsilon connection and algebraic K theory. Yeah, um, thanks so much uh, to the host for inviting me. I said this before, but I think you can't say that enough. So it's really a great uh, pleasure to to speak here today. So as I said earlier, I'm going to give a, a black box talk, but using a using a tablet. So yeah, please bear with me. Did I misspell the RAM? I think I, I did, right? Elaine, can you help me? <laughs> Where do you put the H in the RAM? You put R and then A H. Yeah, wonderful. Oh, okay, point. perfect. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So the Deram epsilon connection and algebraic K theory. So it's going to be the topic. I, I, I told you something false. The H is before the A. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I guess now I just have to I have to stick to it. Okay. Um. So the structure of the talk is the following. At first, I'm going to tell you a bit about the history of the subject. So I'm going to start with an introduction to uh, the Ram epsilon lines, uh, the curve case. So that's like the classical story, if you want. And it is due to Dulin and uh, Bayensen. Lock, I know. And I'm going to emphasize already when, you know, recalling this classical story that the whole subject has a whiff of algebraic K theory. And so, since this is an algebraic K theory online seminar, I'm going to kind of, you know, maybe even exaggerate those connections a little bit. But I find them quite intriguing. And in a way, they haven't been explored a lot, except for the work of uh, Deepan Patel, which is like a higher dimensional generalization of, of um, the Ram epsilon lines using just purely algebraic K theoretic methods. So those I'm going to explain towards the end of the first half of my talk. But before that, I will kind of discuss two uh, constructions, which are somewhat K theoretic. Then after that, I will turn to describing Patel's work. Okay, and so this will re really re just be rather quick, these three sections here, because of course we all want to have our coffee. Okay, and after that, after we uh, re energized by having a nice cup of coffee, I'm going to talk about the epsilon connection. And in particular, I want to discuss uh, an algebraic K theory viewpoint. On the aforementioned connection. So in a way you can think of this as the explanation why I believe that this this k theoretic viewpoint is uh, valuable. And at the very end, if time permits, so admittedly, I don't really have a good feeling for 90 minute talks. Yeah, if there's some time left, then we're going to talk about a kind of a, a gluing construction for epsilon lines, which is like a which gives us a further higher dimensional generalization. Yeah. So that's roughly what I'm planning to cover. Yeah, just as a reminder, uh, that's uh, the plan for the first half. So I'm going to tell you what epsilon factors are all about, or epsilon lines are all about. I'm going to quickly give you two constructions which are somewhat K-theoretic. 
if you know looked at from the right angle. And then I'm gonna briefly discuss uh, Deepan Patel's work. Then we're gonna have coffee. Okay. So let's start with the, the overview of the, the classical story. So we're gonna fix a field K and we're gonna assume that it's a field of characteristic zero and X is going to be a curve. By that I mean in particular that it's smooth and proper and you have dimension one of a K to a, yeah. It's moving proper case key of dimension one. And in addition to that, we're gonna look at an open subset. Of course, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be empty. And we will consider a flat connection curly E on U. And the goal of the, the formalism of the Ram epsilon lines is to understand the graded determinant of the cohomology of this, this flat connection. So you want to understand the graded determinant of the Dirac cohomology. As a tensor product of local factors. That are somewhat that depend on the on the flat connection. So these are called the epsilon factors. And so a priori, this I mean this doesn't make any sense. Uh, just using the setup above, there's one more piece of information that we need. Namely, we need a, a rational one form. So omega would be a one form on U that doesn't vanish anywhere on U, but of course it will have poles and zeros uh, outside of U. But then once, we, once we've chosen such a form, we can define these, these purely local quantities, the so-called epsilon lines. And so those are really graded lines. The graded line, um, just in case, um, yeah, it's probably not necessary to say this, but this is just a pair consisting of a, of a line and um, an integer. In particular, the graded determinant is just a pair consisting of the determinant line of this uh, vector space, the cohomology, uh, viewed as a graded vector space, of course. And uh, the integer, the grading of the determinant line is the Euler characteristic. Okay, so in particular, if you forget all of the line information, all of the line parts, you get quite a nice looking formula that describes the Euler characteristic of this flat local system as a sum of finitely many numbers. And then the information contained in the lines is just like a, a refinement. And <clears throat> so as I said, this whole subject has a, has a whiff of, of algebraic K theory. And I guess it's already uh, visible by just looking at this, this formula because the graded lines, I mean, what, what are they? I mean, they, they can also be, they arise as the, the one truncation of the, the K theory space of the field K. And so particularly you could see, you know, you could view this as a hint that algebraic K theory should play a role in this, in this field. 
then this appearance of the, the one form that is needed in order to define these, these purely local quantities. So maybe I should say that we want those to be purely local. So the appearance of this one form already kind of indicates that this is somewhat more theoretic, right? It has a, a flavor of, of more theory because we're expressing a, a global quantity, the determinant of the homology in terms of a product or a sum of, of local contributions that are computed using a, a one form. Okay. Right, and so yeah, this is really an important property. So we want these local factors. E x omega of the local system E. They should only depend on omega and the local system E near x. And so of course I have to clarify what I mean by near x. I mean that they should be, you know, obtainable just from the, the restriction of omega and E to the formal punctured disk around X. So if you just replace um, E and omega, if you just pull back this pair to the formal disk near X, This would be like the spectrum of the fraction field of the completion. So this restriction should be sufficient. To compute um, this epsilon factor. Okay, so that's what we want. And yeah, when I, when I saw this for the first time, I was really, really intrigued by that, although I've, I've already been familiar with, with MOS theory, but nonetheless, in MOS theory, we actually need a, we need a, a MOS function, right? And usually you don't get away just with a, with a one form. But also in, in the theory of epsilon factors, we, we are not asking for a description of cohomologies or complicated inequalities for the petty numbers. No, we're just, asking for a description of the determinant of cohomology. So that's why it's kind of realistic to, to get that. And I'm gonna start right away with explaining uh, two possible constructions of these uh, Dirham epsilon factors. And the first one I'm going to explain is uh, due to Delim. Um, he, you know, um, described this in, in his seminar, his famous uh, farewell seminar at IHS before uh, leaving IHS. And it's uh, based on his uh, notion of good lattices that he developed uh, earlier, much earlier in his career when he studied uh, regular singularities of differential equations. And something that I really like about the construction is that it's kind of directly giving you this, this product formula for the determinant of cohomology. It just kind of falls out right away. But in order to, you know, motivate it, I want to first start with a very, very special case and a very easy case. Namely, I'm going to start with um, u being x for now, and e being a flat local system that is defined on all of x. Maybe I actually shouldn't say that like that. So now, what's the, what can we say about the determinant of the Dirham cohomology of E? Well, we all know that the Dirham cohomology is just computed by the Dirham complex. 
Okay. So it's just uh, the cohomology of this complex here. And actually, I'm taking I'm taking hypercomology, so over x. So E is just uh, the vector bundle on which the connection lives. And the connection itself defines a, a map from E to E twisted with uh, the canonical bundle, which is a line bundle. And the determinant of cohomology is quite easy to compute using this complex. Namely, we get the following. We get that the greater determinant of the Dram cohomology E is naturally isomorphic to the following tensor product. It's given by the greater determinant of E plus E minus one. Oops, forgot to twist. This E tensor omega one X minus one. Okay. <clears throat> Which of course you can uh, rewrite as uh, the greater determinant of, oops, I, let me start over, I forgot to take homology. It's given by the greater determinant of the cohomology with x coefficients of the complex E plus E twisted with omega one X minus one. And so here I'm just using that the Duram complex, um, if you want, it sits in a distinguished triangle, one being just, you know, where you have E mapping into this complex of sheaves and the cofiber being E tensor omega one X. But of course the determinant of cohomology doesn't really depend on on the extension class itself, this is really a k-theoretic invariant. So we can just pretend that the differential here is zero, and that's what we're what we're doing. As long as we only care about the determinant of cohomology. And similarly, we can choose any other differential. Namely, we can say, okay, that's the same thing as the greater determinant of the cohomology or the hypercomology of the complex. E goes to E tensor omega one X. That we choose as a differential multiplication with a, with a form omega. So this is um, where omega is a one form. Say a regular one form because this is just about motivation on X, which is non-zero. And then the interesting thing that uh, starts appearing right away is that the complex uh, that I wrote above is actually almost everywhere acyclic. Because if omega is a section, which is non-zero, it will have finitely many zeros. And everywhere else, it's going to be invertible. So everywhere else, this map here is going to be an isomorphism, which means that this complex is acyclic away from finitely many points. It's going to be acyclic away from the zeros of omega. And so in particular, we get the following product formula. So there will be finitely many x's. exactly the zeros of, of omega, where we can represent the corresponding factor as the greater determinant of um, just the stock of a complex 
that is supported at X. The product of all of those, by definition, is just the graded determinant of the cohomology we care about. So you see that somehow this, this trick of using that omega 1x is a line bundle, which we can generically trivialize, automatically gives us a decomposition of the graded determinant of the cohomology of the Duron cohomology as a product of finitely many local factors. OK, and so now we're going to build on this idea. And so here is uh, Deline's construction. Remember quickly what the setup was. So we had a, so maybe I can scroll back to show you the setup. So we had a curve X over a field, K of characteristic zero, and we had Tsiriski open subset U and a flat connection defined on U. And then we wanted to define these local factors here, depending on the choice of a, a one form. And we wanted the product to range over points at the complement of you. Okay, so let's see if we can if we can get to that. And the Duran cohomology that we're taking here, so maybe this isn't quite explicit, is actually the Duran cohomology over U, because that's where that's the, the domain of definition of the flat connection. Okay, so let's see what what the link constructions is all about. So it's using these, uh, these good lattices. So if E is a flat, um, connection defined over U, Delin has shown so this is this, um, famous text um, on differential equations with regular singularities, published as a um, lecture notes in mathematics. Um, so they showed that there exists vector bundles M and N. on X such that first of all the restriction of both M and N to U agrees with E so that's the underlying vector bundle of the, the flag connection and secondly if you apply the flag connection nebula to M you land inside of N tensor with not quite differential forms, but rather lock differential forms. So you allow lock poles on the complement of, of U. It's just some, yeah, it's a technical thing. And then, so the third property is the most interesting one. That's really the, the crucial one, is that the complex of sheaves that is now well defined is quasi isomorphic to to the ram push forward of E. I just denote by shady embedding of u into x. And m and n with these properties are known as uh, good lattices.
Right, okay. So in particular, it follows from these uh, defining properties of good lattices that you can use them to compute the Dirac cohomology uh, as a hypercomology of a, of a complex, of something like a Dirac complex. And furthermore, we can use the, this approach to de compute the determinant of the Dirac cohomology uh, in the same way we just did it for uh, a flat connection that didn't have any, any singularities. So here's a, a consequence. So the, the Dirac cohomology, oops, the Dirac cohomology of curly E of the local system is isomorphic to the hypercomology. of this complex that now lives on, on X with log poles. And so this is really a, a replacement for, for the classical Dirac complex in case of a, a local system that has poles. Okay, let me let me rewrite this equation because it's somewhat cru crucial. Okay, and so now we can just uh, use the same spiel uh, as before to to define these local factors. So we get right away that the greater determinant we care about is uh, isomorphic to the greater determinant of um, the cohomology of the complex M zero M omega one log. And as before, we, we have some liberty uh, for the choice of the differential because we only care about the graded determinant. So I'm claiming that with respect to our choice of omega, this complex here is really um, it's really naturally supported on the complement of u. And the reason is simply that if we, if we restrict restricting to u, we can use omega as a differential instead. shows that the K-theory class, K-theory point is represented by the sum uh, is sent to zero in K-theory of of you. And then by localization, it lies in relative K theory. So it's supported in the in the complement. So in particular it breaks off as a sum.
the K theory class, it breaks off as a sum of, of the finitely many stocks for each point of, of the complement. And we define the epsilon factors by taking the graded determinant of these finitely many complexes and vector spaces. Now I'm kind of already emphasizing the, the K theory perspective, maybe a little bit too much. But yeah, I mean, this is also, as a promise, this is also subject as a width of, of algebraic K theory. Sorry, can I uh, ask a question about the construction? Um, so uh, yeah. is, there a, is there a uniqueness? Uh, I mean, does this, uh, are M and N unique here? No, they're not. They're not. Um, I'm not claiming they're unique, but of course you can show that the resulting um, the Ram epsilon lines will not depend on those choices up to a canonical isomorphism. So M and N won't be unique. I mean, you know, it's kind of comparable with if you have a flat connection with regular singularities, um, then, you know, you also have uh, various choices of, of lattices, right? With these Dulin lattices. You know, then like uh, for regular singularities, so let me just quickly say that for regular singularities, Um, M is equal to N, and so you just have this representation. Going to lock differentials. And, you know, there, there's more than one way to represent uh, the same flat connection on U with regular singularities by a, a complex like that. But if you choose like a a section of the map from, you know, the complex numbers to the complex numbers model of the integers, then there's a unique representative. So, no, and no. if I remember correctly, the, Michelle, the same is also true for Michelle, this. Michelle, like there's this. no unique representative, even if you choose a section. Oh, okay. Did I get that wrong? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's completely okay. non-unique in that case. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah, then, then forget the, the uniqueness. Um, no, no, there's uniqueness for the epsilon line, but uh, you choose Yeah, the, one. the epsilon line is unique, okay. But the lattices are always non-unique. Well, I mean, okay. there is a construction which is assigned to one section, but... Uh, yeah. Is there yeah, is a yeah, construction, yeah. but there are many constructions. This is one Okay, con okay, I see, okay. okay yeah, okay. thanks. No, it's also. Okay, so yeah, sorry for getting that wrong. So it's even if you make some choices, it's not unique. But yeah, in, in this case, it's quite easy to come up with examples that show non-uniqueness. So for instance, you could just take, you know, a one-dimensional connection with a pole at a point on a disk or something like that. And you'll see that as long as it's regular, that you can just take any lattice, right? And will be maybe preserved and yeah. So it's it's really highly non-unique, but for the construction of epsilon factors, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So the the resulting expression here can be shown to be independent of the the choices. Okay. So that's the the first construction I wanted to explain. So now here comes the the second. Uh, second construction. Which is um, the one due to Balins and Bloch and uh, Eno. But I'm going to reformulate it uh, slightly. More K-theoretic terms just, you know, hopefully as a crowd pleaser, maybe not. And to be fair, I'm gonna say more about the actual definition of PBE uh, later, but I just want to remark that I, I believe this reformulation is entirely equivalent to what they did, but I haven't checked all of the details. But it certainly produces a, a maybe different uh, formalism of epsilon factors. 
Okay, and so this one is kind of emphasizing the, the local nature of the, the whole construction. So now we're going to replace x, oops, we're going to replace x by d. So this is like a formal disk. And u is going to be simply the, the generic point. So this will be the spectrum. Okay. <clears throat> and so starting with a flat connection E, on D tilde and omega um, non-zero section or no way vanishing section on, on U. We're going to, to cook up a graded line uh, using the following uh, expression. And so this will require some, some explanation. So we're going to associate it the graded line represented by the following binary complex. So this is a binary complex, uh, Alec Rayson. So this means it's a graded vector space with uh, two differentials that are, you know, completely independent. And I'm claiming that if you view some things in the right way, this is actually uh, an acyclic binary complex in a, a quotient category of the, the category of linearly locally compact uh, vector spaces of OK. So in fact, so, sorry, just a quick comment from the, from the chat. Uh, I think uh, Grayson mm -hmm. is uh, spelled with an A. Yeah, I've spelled it with an A. Oh, OK, it was a little hard to read. Okay, so it's an acyclic binary complex in a, in a quotient of category. Linearly locally compact K vector spaces, also known as Tate vector spaces. I'm not going to say too much uh, about these Tate vector spaces because this is only tangentially related to what I'm going to talk about later on. But it's nonetheless uh, quite in spirit of the original definition of Bailey's and Bloch and no. um, So essentially, what are we doing here? Well, E is a, a vector bundle, a free vector bundle of this punctured local disk. So we can just view it as a free module over this field here, the field of formal Nora series, which carries an interesting topology, the, the, the theatic topology. And it is an example, one of the, the main examples of a linearly locally compact vector space. And <clears throat> so the map given by multiplication with omega is a bona fide isomorphism in this category. So the, the second differential is actually um, acyclic without making any, taking any quotients or anything like that. And the first differential, the um, which is just a connection, Nabla, um, is not acyclic. It has some cohomology, but the cohomology can be shown to be finite dimensional. 
in particular, if you now take uh, the quotient of just these linearly locally compact vector spaces, model all the linearly compact ones, which include finite dimensional ones, you get an actual acyclic complex, acyclic binary complex. And here, the binary complex above is acyclic. And so now the, <clears throat> we can take a look at uh, Grayson's paper. And we see that uh, acyclic binary complexes represent uh, elements of the, the loop space <clears throat> of the K-theory space. So this would be the loop space of the K-theory space of these uh, linearly locally compact dotate spaces over K, quotiented out by the compact ones. And according to a result by uh, Sho Saito, the K-theory space that I'm considering here is actually isomorphic itself to the suspension, suspension of the K-theory space of K. So this is just uh, defining a, an object of the K-theory space of uh, the field K. So just as a reminder, we can view this binary complex, this acyclic binary complex, as defining an element here. Defining a point here. And then of course we can use the degraded determinant to get the actual graded line that we that we're looking for. Okay, so, so this is essentially the, the construction used by uh, Bailey and bloch -Henau. So they were using this kind of, this property, this delooping property of Tate spaces that I attributed to Sho Saito. But there's a different construction which doesn't use K-theory, but it's, it's very similar. Uh, but they didn't use the, the binary complexes, so they, they just worked with automorphisms of of Tate spaces to extract a graded line. Okay, so maybe, is it okay if I take five more minutes to finish the first half or should we take a break now? Um, definitely, I think you should, you should take five more minutes. Um, okay, yeah, uh, excellent, thanks. But so actually, if I could ask uh, just yeah? about, uh, so, I guess another way is is a correct so another way of saying this so 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 omega is an isomorphism as you said so it's another way of saying this that if you have a um, so if you have a a, a Tate vector space uh, like mm -hmm. E and uh, a self map of E with uh, um, with finite dimensional kernel and co kernel then mm -hmm. you should naturally get a determinant from it that if you have absolutely yeah map. and even more generally I mean you just need the kernel and co kernel to be compact. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, and sorry. So I, I guess if you have uh, if you if you have a map between spaces, if you have a map already between compact vector spaces, or mm -hmm. uh, then uh, or an endomorphism of a compact vector space, then this is going to be trivial. Precisely. Yeah. Thank you. And that's almost how you prove these kind of reciprocity statements that related to the determinant of the global object but not quite because it's not an endomorphism of a compact object, but of a discrete object that, that works just as well. So yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, you're kind of sketching out uh, the main ideas behind the, the subject here <laughs> in your remark. Okay, any, any more questions or? Okay, good, then let me quickly uh, finish the first part. So I'm gonna talk about Patel's construction. So here's the, the setup. So quite remarkably, Patel's construction works for arbitrary smooth and proper varieties. 
doesn't have to be a curve. And U is still uh, going to be an open set. S is a subset of the, the cotangent space, which will be some kind of fixed singular support. And omega is a one form on U such that the graph of omega does not intersect S. And so now what uh, Patel does, he, he constructs a There is a map of spectra epsilon factor with respect to omega from the K theory spectrum of uh, D modules on X with singular support in S. to just a normal K theory of perfect complexes on X supported on the complement of U, such that this diagram here commutes. So you can compute the, the, the RAM cohomology of uh, D module of singular support in S simply by, by taking the usual coherent cohomology of this K theory class that lives on the complement of U. And yeah, the, the construction is really, really nice as well. So let me just briefly sketch uh, what goes into it. So, first of all, there's a one observes that there's a natural equivalence between the full. Uh, K theory of all different of all D modules and the K theory of the, the cotangent space. That's because uh, D is a filtered algebra whose associated gradient is isomorphic to the structure sheaf of the cotangent bundle. And so you could just think of this as something like an A1 homotopy between the two. So this is due to, to Quillen. This is an isomorphism. And so you can further refine this by adding in the, the singular supports. So this goes to the K theory of the cotangent bundle with the singular support S. Note that um, we're no longer claiming that uh, that's an isomorphism here. And so now um, what we do is we have to use uh, a one homotopy. So the K theory of T star X is actually just isomorphic to the K theory of X because it's a, it's a vector bundle. It's the total space of a vector bundle and X is, is smooth. <laughs> And so what um, the tell showed was that, so maybe let me draw it in this way. There's a natural map completing this to commute to this diagram that lands in the K theory with supports in the complement of U. And this is where the differential is being used. And maybe I can I can get back to that after the break. I feel Beth already going over time for six minutes, so I'll quickly try to to summarize this construction after after the break is over. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so thanks. Uh, so, um, are there any? I guess are there any questions?
questions before the break? Sorry, so there was a question in the I was wondering if you, uh, are you writing that the right way? Like I would thought, think if you should write K3 of X, comma U, you know, to mean supported on the complement of U. But maybe I'm missing. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Could you, could you repeat the question? I, I meant if you're, if you're talking about K theory supported on the complement of U, just as a mm -hmm. matter of writing, shouldn't that be K of X comma U, you know, not K of X I, comma X minus I think it's just a question of, um, what do you mean? Yeah. of conventions, but usually what I do is I have a closed subset I uh, denote by kx comma set, you know, the k theory of perfect complexes with support on x, with on set. Okay, I mean, if it's, yeah. it's just a matter of conventions, I guess. Yeah. So I had a quick question about the statement of this last result. Uh huh. Um, so you just say there there is a map of spectra, but is it somehow in some way natural or uniquely characterized by? Um, there there might be a, there might be such a characterization, but I don't think uh, there is a characterization given in Patel's paper. So it depends on this choice of omega. And it's you know character. I mean the the important property is that there is this. I mean I, I just didn't add this here because I only said it such that the diagram Thanks. I have a question. Uh, up until recent the, the, the ending of the construction with block BBB, K th you you could have taken K of X as being K zero of X, but all of a sudden you're taking the loops on K. And where did that transition happen? Um, <laughs> uh, um, I got the impression that he dropped out while he was trying to answer my question. It was happening in groups and in K0 and all of a sudden um, you start taking loops on K and loops on the suspension of K and mm -hmm. I, I was interpreting that in terms of groups as K passing from the relative K1 but then all of a sudden you were doing spectra. So at what point, when you talk about loops of K of locally compact, where's the homotopy coming in there? Where's, where, where's the, the, the spectrum coming in? Okay, maybe let me share my screen so I can do a better job at answering your question. Can take a look at the notes. Okay, so I was describing various descriptions here, right? Yeah, and there's where the loops came in. Exactly. So the loops uh, come in because of uh, this result by Grayson that acyclic binary complexes in some exact category represent points in the loop space of the K-theory space of that category. Well, they represent elements of K1 as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah because they correspond to elements of the, the loop space. But I don't want to work just in K1 because we, we actually care about something a bit, a bit richer. We care about graded lines. So we care about elements of the one truncation of the K-theory space. So that's why I'm kind of working in this kind of homotopical framework. And so the, you know, the, the observation here is that if you take uh, an ASAP binary complex, its K-theory spells itself, space itself, corresponds to omega K of the, the exact category um, in which the, over which the binary complexes are defined. So in our case, this was this quotient. And as I said, by the theorem of Shosaito, that's just equivalent to the loop space of the sus suspension of the K-theory of K. So this way we get a, an actual point of the K-theory space, which we can think of as a graded line. Okay. Does that answer your question? And I mean, you also maybe had some question about the K-theory spectra that appeared later in Patel's No, that, that didn't bother me. It was, it was when you do, when you're writing yeah. loops on K and then you're writing K of X and you're writing an element of K of X. Mm -hmm. So what you're, when you put the brackets around it, you mean an element of K zero, I think. 
I'm not meaning an element of K0. I think of it as like a, a homotopy point of the K-theory space. And which model of K-theory are you using? You can take any model of K-theory, but maybe, yeah. Okay, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, if you have any exact category C, there's a natural map from the, the group point of that category to the K-theory space. And so in our case, I'm taking for C these binary acyclic complexes defined over this quotient of, of Tate theory, of Tate spaces. Okay, so I see how it goes. goes. Hmm? I see how it goes now. Okay, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay, should I continue with the talk or are there any other questions? I had a very quick and probably very dumb question. Uh, I just didn't quite understand what you mean by the word line. Okay, so line is really just a, a one-dimensional vector space over the field K. Okay, thanks. And yeah, later on when we take more general rings, you can just think of it as a line bundle. So it's really just replacing that. Yeah. Okay. Should I continue or other further questions? I guess you should continue. Good. Okay, so I think I promised uh, to say a few more words about uh, Patel's construction. So let me do that and I'll try to be fast. So again, Patel is constructing this map epsilon omega from the K theory of D modules with singular support in S to the K-theory of complexes supported on the complement of U. And the important property is that this diagram here commutes. So this means that the coherent cohomology of this complex defined by Patel is isomorphic to the Dram cohomology of the D-module. Okay, and so here's um, the diagram that, uh, that is used in the construction. So the K-theory of D-modules is isomorphic to the K-theory of the cotangent space. And similarly, there's a map from the K-theory of D-modules with singular support in S to the K-theory of the cotangent space with support in S. And so Patel noticed that this uh, map, this space itself can be further mapped down to the K-theory of X with support in the complement. Um, right. And so this construction here really uses the, the differential form. And it's a nice consequence of the localization theorem. So let me quickly explain that. So you just take, um, take a look at the following diagram. So you have the, the K theory of X to the K theory of U mapping to the K theory the complement. And so this line, of course, is a, a fiber sequence. And we're going to write the top row as well. So here we have the, the K theory of the cotangent space and the K theory. This will map to the K theory of um, the complement of S. This, um, <clears throat> we see some map from the K theory of the cotangent space with support in S. And so now here, <clears throat> there's a natural map, which is actually an isomorphism, just given by pullback along the zero section. And there, there's another map, which is given by pullback along omega. And so here we're using the assumption that omega of U does not intersect the singular support S. So that's one of the, the defining assumptions in, <clears throat> in Patel's approach. So since this diagram here can be shown to commute, we get a natural map here. And so now we're almost uh, where we want to be because um, 
we're using um, the maps that we constructed earlier. So we have a map from the K theory of D modules with support in S to the K theory of the cotangent space with support in S. And by assumption, it maps to zero here because the singular support doesn't intersect uh, the graph of the, the form omega. So the pullback will be zero. And hence, we'll, <coughs> we get this, uh, this map here, this factory section here. This composition here is this Patel's map. So this is Patel's epsilon factor. And it's just using the localization sequence plus uh, A1 invariance of K-theory. Okay, so now that's really the conclusion of the first part of my talk. And in the second talk, I want to explain what we can gain from uh, these K-theory perspectives on the Ram epsilon lines that I was advocating earlier. And I believe, and so this is uh, contractual, that we get a new viewpoint on the, the epsilon connection that was introduced by Bayes and Block in NO. So what is for sure is that we get a, <clears throat> a different connection, a different epsilon connection that is canonically defined on these epsilon lines. And I, I expect it to be isomorphic to the connection defined by Bayes and Block and NO. So that's really the, the content of the, the second part understanding the epsilon connection. So let me <clears throat> start with a brief uh, review of what this is about. So in the paper, the Bailens and Block and the No defined uh, the Ram epsilon lines. They also observed that uh, it can be defined in families. actually define epsilon lines for families of flat connections. So here you, this means you simply take a commutative A algebra a, and you take a look at a, you pick a family E A, <clears throat> and the base change. And omega A will be an element be a relative differential form, which is Nova vanishing on U. And then in, in this setup, under certain assumptions on, on this family flag connections, one can define an actual graded line together with a flag connection of it. So BBE showed that if E A is epsilon nice. And then some other papers by, by Balance and I also found the notation blissful. So this is a blissful family. Uh, then one can define
an epsilon line which is not really a graded line bundle. On A. And so furthermore, and that's really really quite nice. There's a natural like connection. crystal structure on this line bundle. Which we call the, the epsilon connection. Okay, so somehow I, I was always always intrigued by, by the existence of this connection until the construction of uh, Balance and Block Lenoir is actually somewhat representation theoretic. So they also they use this, this perspective with uh, linearly, locally, linearly locally compact vector spaces. And they show that uh, there is a natural central extension on the orthogonal group of this vector space E uh, direct sum with its dual. And then you use representation theory for the orthogonal group, some, some basic properties of that to construct the, the, the flat connection. So this epsilon connection, which is really quite uh, remarkable, but also equally mysterious. <clears throat> and so given that I, you know, um, I was always advocating this kind of K-theoretic uh, viewpoint on epsilon factors, I got curious in whether you could construct this, con this connection directly using, using algebraic K theory, or some basic properties of algebraic K theory. And so here's my, my proposition, how you could do that. Um, Let me first start with uh, a naive, uh, naive picture. And this picture is so naive that it's actually wrong. But it's nonetheless quite helpful. And just for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the case where the family of the connections is actually constant. So that. Um, E A be a constant family. Constant families are certainly blissful. But um, allow the the one form omega A. very okay and so now um first of all defining the the family version of the epsilon factor without the connection is not not so difficult yeah. So as before, one can one could, for instance, take this uh, this acyclic binary complex and 
and you know around each point and that would define an epsilon factor so define a, an element of the k theory space of a and then with the graded determining construction we can really extract a, a graded line Okay, and then of course any other construction of uh, epsilon lines that we've seen earlier in this talk could be used uh, in view of this one. By Patel's construction, you have to be a little bit careful because it uses a one invariance, uh, which is not going to be true of a general base rings A, but there's a, re a replacement for A1 invariance that uh, allows one to modify the, the construction appropriately. So it also applies to the, the general case. Okay, so this way we, we've got the graded line associated to this family of one forms. And now we just have to figure out how to define a natural flag connection on it. Sorry, can I, can I just, uh, I'm sorry, there's a question in the chat mm -hmm. that if you could clarify what it means to be non-constant? Well, you know, I'm going to explain what it means to be constant rather than okay. explain non-constant. So constant means that you take a family of a K and you base change it to A. So this means that, you know, you just take a family of a K and you base change to A. And any family that is isomorphic to such a thing is, is constant. And, you know, non-constant families could be, for instance, those where the, the flag connection varies widely at different points, so the irregularity could jump. So that would be an example of a non-blissful family, for instance. So somehow this condition of being blissful guarantees that the irregularity stays about the same, so the, the connection should be equi-regular. But, but you, you wrote that, that once you have the constant thing, that it allows the one form to be non-constant. What does this allow to be non-constant mean? Just means that it doesn't have to be a, a base change. It doesn't have to be defined of okay. In a direction. Okay. okay, thank you. So it's like a family of one forms parameterized by A, which is non-constant. So, you know, if you want, you can think of Omega A is something like an A point of this vector space of, of differential forms. So it's an honest A point which doesn't come from a K point. Okay. So now the question is how can we get this? Uh, how can we get a natural connection on this on this graded line? And so now we're gonna use a use the following idea. Again, so now I'm describing just the idea. That's technically speaking wrong to construct a connection. <clears throat> on the epsilon factor. So here we go. What we have to do is we have to construct a, a crystal structure. We want a crystal structure. On the epsilon factor. I.e. If um, omega zero and omega one are two one forms such that the restriction to the reduced ring is the same. Then we want an isomorphism of the corresponding epsilon lines.
And furthermore, this isomorphism would satisfy the co-cycle condition. Should be satisfied for triples. Forms that have the same restriction to the reduced part. So let me recall these are really families of differential forms. Okay, <clears throat> so in the co-cycle condition that really correspond. Oops, somehow my tablet just changes automatically to the eraser. So yeah, this co-cycle condition corresponds to to flatness. So uh, a crystal, which is given by this data, together with the Kozaki condition, corresponds to flat connection on a line bundle, or on a, on a sheaf more generally. Okay, so that's the kind of um, structure that we're trying to to get out of the the formalism, and it just kind of falls out automatically from the properties of algebraic K theory. And so here's the the Neef, uh, construction. So consider following a family of forms. So one minus T times omega zero plus T times omega one. So this defines a form omega T and I kind of view it as something like an A1 homotopy between omega zero and omega one. And furthermore, we have that the restriction of omega t to the reduced part of A is always constant. It's just equal to omega zero reduced, restricted to the reduced part. And similar, it's equal to omega one restricted to the reduced part, just by, by construction. And so now we can, we can apply the family version of epsilon factors to this family of one forms. And we get an epsilon factor E epsilon X comma omega T, which is a graded line, or which is an element of the, the K theory if you want. The K theory of the polynomial ring over A. Or the K theory of the affine space over A. And there are two restriction maps. There are two restriction maps. There's one given by evaluation at zero. There's another one given by evaluation at, at one, mapping to the K theory of A. And this way we recover the epsilon factors associated to omega zero and omega one. But now, and so here's the, the naive part of this naive construction. Using A1 invariance of K theory, we actually get a, an equivalence between these two epsilon factors. So let me again put in brackets that this is wrong. So that we need to modify this idea slightly using one invariance, okay, we get the natural isomorphism between these two epsilon factors because we just used an A1 family defining one form to the other. And, you know, waving my hands A1 invariance of K theory gives us that these two forms, these two graded lines agree. But of course, the, there's a big problem here, and I'm sure all of you have already spotted it. A1 invariance of K is only true for regular rings, or maybe slightly more general classes of rings as well, but certainly it won't apply uh, in the amount of generality that we needed here. Because in our case, A really has to be a, a non-reduced commutative ring. I don't want to make any assumptions on it in order to really get a, a crystal structure. So, a one invariance of K is simply not true. 
So here's the problem. As I announced, there will be a problem. One invariance doesn't hold the required generality. But luckily there's a fix. So this fix requires simply to replace uh, A1 by P1. So we use the decay theory of P1 over A is isomorphic to the K theory of A plus the K theory of A. And please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I believe the original citation in this level of generality would be, would be Thomson. And furthermore, we can actually be a little bit more precise here. I think at the level you're talking, it's two to Quillen. Okay, thank you. And let me just add the name here. So, we have the following uh, commutative diagram of spectra, which is actually Cartesian. We have a Cartesian diagram. Even split Cartesian. Um, where I is a section of, it's just a rational point of, of P1. And so is set such that we should write spec of A. So images do not intersect. And so now we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to define um, A infinity one A to be the, the fiber, oh, sorry, the cofiber of uh, this map. So I is like the point at infinity, if you want. And then um, the result above amounts to infinity P1A being naturally isomorphic to a, A. And this is our replacement for, for M1 
homotopy variants. Okay, so essentially the only thing you have to do is you have to say, okay, the, the family omega t that we, of one function that we constructed above, actually defines a natural point in this version of K-theory with a modulus condition. I think that's what it should amount to. And so essentially, so this is our epsilon x omega t. Here we go from the, the K-theory of flat connections on, on U. And there will be two uh, specialization maps, or two, evolu evolu two evaluation maps, excuse me. Uh, one being by pulling back along the point zero, which is a point of P1. Another one being pulling back about around one, along one. But actually, by the above, I can complete this to the following commutative diagram. All of these evaluation, evaluation maps are actually isomorphisms, and they are just isomorphic to, to K of A. And hence, you get a natural isomorphism between epsilon x omega zero and epsilon x omega one. Okay, and so that's precisely the, the sort for crystal structure. So the only missing point is to verify the cosarchy condition, which means you have to work with, with triples. Um, but yeah, it kind of also falls out of, of the properties of epsilon factors. And the generalization of this A1 invariance or generalized A1 invariance of K theory. Okay. So one uh, remark I want to make so this defines a, an epsilon connection on on your fa fa you know on your favorite k theoretic version of uh, epsilon lines and I expect this connection to be the same as the epsilon connection defined by Bailey's and blocking but I don't know it so you could say I, I conjecture it I mean I'm kind of really Really optimistic, but I at the same time I wouldn't know how to how to show it. So I expect the epsilon connection constructed above to agree with BBE's epsilon connection. So these two connections should be should be the same. And then um, there's a further remark here, namely in, in BBE's paper, they're actually working with families of connections and families of one forms, as long as the family of connections um, are blissful. And so for a long time, I, I didn't really know how to define um, generalization of blissful families um, in, in a higher dimensional context, say, you know, in the context of, of Patel's work. But um, yeah, recent work of uh, Eno and Zabar seems to indicate a, a possible definition. So there's now a candidate 
definition of listful families. connections in arbitrary dimensions and yeah this is based on a reason work by Eno and uh, Seba. Essentially, what they, what they have shown is Oh, someone's getting a call. I am. I'm going to have to drop out. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> So I know in Saba showed that uh, good lattices, oh, holy moly, good lattices uh, also exist uh, in higher dimensions. That is, in other words, if you take a, a flat connection defined on U, they use a, an open dense sub variety of a smooth proper variety X. You can find um, a bunch of vector bundles on X such that there is a, a, a kind of logarithmic Lorentz complex. Just relating different vector bundles. E0, E1, E2, and so on, going up to En. And so essentially, what I expect is that this full family is in higher dimensions correspond to those families of the connections. Where a family of good lattices exists. Essentially, you know, and Sabah show that this is the case just of a or a characteristic zero field. They do it for the complex numbers, but I mean, the, there are some ways to, to descend it. And so all of this is, is work in progress, I should say. And then um, the point is that blissfulness should correspond to flat connections, families of flat connections that have good lattices, such as families of vector bundles with these properties. And then we can also define a family version of um, epsilon factors and using the argument sketched above, you get a natural flat connection in that case as well. Okay, and I think since I'm already running out of time, it's probably best to to conclude uh, the talk with this. And with your with your questions, of course, if you have any. Okay, so let's let's thank Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is there a constructible analog of this whole story? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, is there you... a constructible analog of this story? Like QL, analytic sheaves, I think. Like oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very good question. So, you know, if I, if I had more time, I could have explained that maybe. <laughs> yeah, so the whole story actually started uh, on the analytic side. So that's usually, you know, what people mean when they say epsilon factors. But yes, in the, in the case of um, an analytic local system on a curve, on an open core curve, and a rational one form, you can extract um, a bunch of numbers for each point of the complement as before, uh, depending on the, the rational one form, of course, such that the product of these numbers agrees with the, 
the Frobenius eigenvalue acting on the determinant of the cohomology. And that's really what got the whole subject started. And in a way, you know, there are various ways of, uh, of showing that numerical identity, and it's not clear that this numerical identity comes from an actual product of, of QL lines, but this, that's pretty much the expectation. I see. But so the nice thing about the, the Diram story is that there's actually a direct local definition of these, these epsilon factors. And that's not the case in the Aladic, the Aladic version. So there are kind of a bunch of steps where one uses um, global techniques to so kind of embed a term of a curve into P1 and you extend the connection such that at infinity you get a regular pole until you know what the, the corresponding epsilon factor should be. You kind of use this, this back and forth to, to define the epsilon factors. And in the Diram story, you're not you're not forced to do that. You can just directly give a definition of what the Diram epsilon line is, and you can show the, the product form there, by the way. Cool, thank you. All right. More questions? Well, there's one in the chat from Dan Christensen. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I somehow the chat didn't. Well, I, uh, I, I can read it, or? I can read uh, uh, Have you, so the question from, uh, uh, Jen Grayson is, have you seen acyclic binary complexes of length greater than one arise in this area? Um, not, not really, unfortunately. So actually, I mean, for the higher dimensional version, there's also an approach why uh, acyclic binary complexes, but actually just like multi-complexes, but you know, each piece is of length two, they're kind of multi-complexes living under the cube so they're kind of a length two in each direction of the cube. So I wasn't able to use complexes of length greater than two to construct um, epsilon lines directly. So yeah, unfortunately, the, the answer is no. So yeah, I can't see what's written in the, the chat as long as I'm sharing my screen, so I can... Well. There's a further question uh, but whether uh, it's enough for to take length one or, or two cyclic binary complexes. Yeah, I think Oli was just um, citing this paper by, yeah, by Kaskowski and Wingers, the length one or two. Yeah, again, that's a question of convention that, that it suffices to represent, uh, to obtain the loop space of, of K theory. I have a quick question about, uh, oh, sorry, go on, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask a question. I just, I didn't quite, when you, when you defined the naive approach mm -hmm. uh, at the end, um, you wrote down an explicit connection over A1, mm -hmm. and then you said, well, aha, that doesn't work because they, K3 is not homotopy invariant, and so instead we'll use P1, but it, it, is there an obvious way of explicitly extending this connection over P1? Actually, it's, it's not the connection that we're, oh. that we're deforming, it's, it's just the one forms. Oh, because it's the, con you're yeah. still in the constant setting. Exactly, the, yeah. Oh, okay. So for okay. constant or for blissful families, I mean, this, this works. But essentially, the thing that is varying is the one form. And that's where it, the connection is kind of, you know, it's a connection with respect to the one form direction, if you want. And so here, what if what if done in the naive approach, we've just taken you know the, the usual homotopy between two points in an affine space, right? The usual path, and so that thing extends to P one, but of course with singularities. Yeah. So this will give you you know it will be give you a complex of sheaves, but you have to twist. You have to twist by the divisor at infinity, but twisting by that divisor is exactly what you need in order to get an element of this uh, k infinity that I, I defined. Yeah, so that, because that's exactly the, the resolution of the, the point at infinity, the structure chief of that point. It sounds a lot like motifs with modulus. Is that... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I was kind of, I was saying that this is like K-theory with a modulus condition. I, I don't know how to make this precise. I, yeah. If, if anyone has an idea how to make that link kind of <laughs> more concrete, then I, I'd, I'd be really happy to hear it. Sounds fun. <laughs> 
So I just had a quick question about this, uh, about the blissful condition. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering, uh, why doesn't the like the, the Burlington block, you know, construction, uh, just I mean, taking like the determinant of some operator, why, why, what is, why, why do you need this condition? You mean for arbitrary families? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, essentially, what's going to happen is that. So if you're in the context of more general ring, not just a field, then that kind of two different kinds that you could mean by compact. So it could be like a compact object, could be like a, you know, that means like an inverse limit of finite dimensional things. But it could be an inverse limit of kind of coherent sheaves or of actual, you know, things that are projective. And it's the latter that you want in order to, to have this connection with algebraic K theory. So essentially, if the family is allowed to vary arbitrarily, the kernel and the co-kernel would not be perfect if you, you know, so the complex would not be perfect essentially. Yeah, not the kernel and the co-kernel. So, and it's this kind of perfect condition that you need in order to plug it into this algebraic K theory machine. But the blissfulness of the family guarantees that it is. So, yeah. That's great, thanks. <laughs> Any more? Any more questions? If I may ask something stupid, uh, I would like to ask first of all. Uh, so, what? Uh, just a learning question. What would be the uh, attic analog of a blissful family? And maybe the second question is elaborating on what Chuck was asking. So, mm -hmm. would it actually be okay? To, I mean, at least in the case of curves, to do the whole story just in the uh, zero one truncation instead of using full K theory, like as a sheaf of stable zero one types or something like that. Uh, for most of what I was talking about today, yes. Um, in the higher dimensional case, I mean, so this very last section that I didn't get to, the one that was kind of with time permits, it's actually about gluing epsilon factors together. So there you have like a bunch of differentials on your variety, and you're kind of defining a new epsilon factor, which is like kind of a descent version of that epsilon factor with respect to all of these differential forms. And in order to you know, get that uh, gluing process going, you actually need the full information that is contained in the KP spectrum. So also in the higher levels. But if you just care about defining the, the flag connection, for instance, the epsilon connection, then you don't need it. Then you just need the, the graded lines. Yeah. And the l analog of blissful? Oh, the l analog of blissful, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's been studied. I mean, not even sure, you know, if you would have to first make sense of what's a family of Eladic connections, right? Eladic local systems. So you could, you know, you could replace the QL by, by some finite type algebra of a QL, of course, that, that would make sense. But, you know, the definition of these epsilon factors is not really, it only makes sense of a QL. It's only numerical, so it's not clear what, <laughs> what a family of epsilon factors would be, right? There's no, as far as I know, there's no definition of Eladic epsilon lines that you could define for all one forms and for all local systems. The only, under certain technical conditions, you can use some kind of Fourier transform construction, like Tallinn Fourier construction that was the approach of Lamar that gives you an actual graded complex for some, for some one forms, for certain one forms, but not for all of them. So yeah, it's, you, you see, I mean, the whole theory in the Yaladic case is actually, it's more like numerical and it's not really categorical. It's kind of, uh, it's begging for categorification. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And any further questions? Um, if, if not, we'll, um, so yeah, so I guess this was the last meeting of the summer and we'll resume uh, so our next meeting will be uh, September 15th, so on a Tuesday, uh, uh, Bert Tara will be speaking. Um, and so finally, let's, um, let's thank Michelle for, for a very nice talk. Um, thank you. Um, I want to I wanna say let's thank the organizers for organizing such a nice seminar and keeping us all entertained over summer. <laughs>